analysis requirements has given rise to an age of big data. In the 1970s, magnetic media was pushing against the first megabyte barrier, so the first megabyte hard disk with the size of a suitcase. But by the end of the next decade, 10 times that same amount of data could fit onto the three and a half inch form factor of the hard disk in a mini computer. By the end of the 1990s, magnetic media had pushed past the gigabyte barrier. And by the beginning of the 21st century, the terabyte barrier had been breached. And the data storage industry was branching out into solid state memory and media. And while the growing ability to store large amounts of data was impressive, the ability to retrieve and analyze data sets through structured queries broke the demand for improvements in data transfer capabilities. Today, multi gigabyte transfers across cables and solid state buses are common, and we march steadily onward towards achieving near instantaneous data transfer capabilities, enabling real time simulation and the beginnings of artificial intelligence that has the potential to rival the speed and accuracy of the human brain. Scientific fields, from astronomy to meteorology, from weather prediction to blast simulation, began to rise in large part because of the technological advances of the data storage sector. We have reached the point at which large-scale simulation of the Earth's atmosphere and its surface layers of vegetation and water can be simulated in real time by a computer that draws fewer than 2,000 watts of power and can be rack-mounted in a standard cabinet. By scaling to higher levels of memory and processing power, tasks that once required months of intensive work can now be done in a few days and done with less environmental noise and less radiative heat transfer into the data center. As our astronomical observatory sent an ever-increasing amount of data to our ground stations, and particle physics laboratories generate massive amounts of tracking data, the scientific demand for free storage capabilities and efficient processing power continue to divide our industry. From the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to CERN, our scientific research projects represent the largest data demands in history, extending well into the petabyte region. The evolution of the data center has taken a long road from the 1970s to today. Now we are in the beginnings of a technological era that is yielding new discoveries through massive data analyses, and the advancements made in this era may lead inevitably to another breakthrough in data science that may spark the birth of a sentient artificial intelligence. Welcome to the age of big data. From the Department of Physics, Astronomy, and Computational Sciences here at George Mason University, please join me in welcoming Kirk Bourne. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, any questions? <laughs> okay, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, topic, big data, small world. My background is astronomy, but I work primarily nowadays in the field of data science, and I'll tell you more about that as we go along. But I want to couch this initially in the context of astronomy, so I have a, some astronomy content at the beginning, and then we'll sort of launch into the more general story of this big data phenomenon. So the, the astronomy context I want to give you to start with is the idea of the size of the observatories and surveys of the sky that we're now embarking upon are so much larger than those of the past. So my interest in sort of the, what we now call big data or data science, uh, I, we called data mining maybe 15 years ago, my first sort of foray into that and, and sort of awareness of that problem was very close uh, to some of the things that Alex was just referring to. Back in the uh, late 1990s and early part of the uh, 2000s, I was working at NASA, and I was working specifically in the uh, Astronomical Data Center uh, at, at NASA, where we basically archived all of the space science data that NASA had collected from all of its missions and all of its space science experiments since the beginning of NASA. So our job was basically to curate these data, make them publicly available, for the rest of time, okay, much in the, in the sense of a, of a traditional library. Okay? So scientists would con conduct these experiments at universities or wherever, and when, the, when they, their funding was finished and their project would finish, the data would go to NASA. So one of these projects contacted us, and specifically they, they talked with me, since I was the lead astronomer in that group at the time, and they, it was for a project called MACHO. Anyone ever heard of the MACHO project? Which was a search for microlensing events looking at the, Milky, the center of the Milky Way bulge and the, and the Magellanic Clouds and just repeated, repeat, 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 repeat observations to look for transient events, that is, sudden peaks in the brightness, which would be a signal of a gravitational lens. Well, this survey of data, which re was a many repeat observations of these patches of the sky, generated a terabyte of data. Now, a terabyte is nothing, because I'm sure every laptop in the room and every laptop you know has a terabyte drive now. But in 1998, or 1999, I can't remember the exact year, a terabyte was huge. <laughs> I mean, it was enormously huge. So huge, in fact, 
that uh, something happened when I, uh, these folks contacted me and said, hey, we got this data set. Uh, we'd like to make it publicly available through the NASA Space Astronomy Data Center. And so I went to the, uh, to the managers of the facility at the time, and I said, hey, we got this opportunity to get this terabyte data set. What do you think? And they looked at me like I had 10 heads on, right? <laughs> and they looked at me and said, you know, Kirk, you know, we archive every single data set, space science data set, since the beginning of NASA. We have 15,000 different data sets here, 15,000 different experiments of data. All of the data from 15,000 experiments. The sum total of all of those data is about one terabyte. And you're asking us to bring in one more experiment equal to the sum of the other 15,000. Well, this was not going to work, OK? So that was, at the time, considered like outrageous. Okay, we don't consider that outrageous now, but it's almost like talking about an exabyte today. I mean, it's sort of outrageous. Okay, so another example I use is this thing. Okay, this is a CD-ROM. It holds about half a gigabyte of data. Okay, so you can store music on it, or you can store data on it, or whatever. You can store files on it. You can store whatever, right? You can store your music, MP3s, or whatever. So you can get about a half a gigabyte on one of these things. So traditionally, when my students would come to me and say, hey, I want to work on a project, I want to analyze some data, I want to learn how to do astronomy, I want to learn this and that, I would hand them a CD, sort of like this, and I just transferred a half gigabyte of data in a half a second. Now, two things about this. A, the transfer rate by sneaker net is so much faster <laughs> than the wires, okay, than bandwidth on the wires. And so bandwidth has been improving over the years, but it's not keeping up with the growth of data, and I'll tell you more about that. But the other thing about this is the size of our data sets in astronomy and, up and elsewhere are growing such that this is no longer what we're talking about in terms of the data volumes. So when the student comes to me now and I hand him the CD, that's not even a, a scratch of the surface of the amount of data that is available. So this project here, the Large Synoptic Survey telescope project, which is not funded yet and not built yet. I'll tell you about that in a few seconds. This telescope, when operational, if it fulfills its full 10-year mission, will generate about 200 petabytes of data. So two of these is a gigabyte. 2,000 of these is a terabyte. Two million of these is a petabyte. 400 million of these is 200 petabytes. 400 million of these would probably fill a football stadium wall to wall, floor to ceiling, completely. So now when the student comes to me and says, I want to analyze some LSST data, I'll say, rent yourself about 5,000 dump trucks and head off to the stadium and fill it up and tell me what you learned by tomorrow. No, it's just, it's just not going to happen. The scale is completely different. So when people say, oh, we've always had big data, well, in some sense, yes, we, we have, we, it's always pushing the limit of our capability. I think now it's gone exponentially beyond our capability. It's just not feasible anymore to use the old way of doing things. And so anyway, so I'll talk to you about this project. This is just to set context, and I'll talk about how big data is changing the world in which we live. So LSST, uh, uh, George Mason University, is a partner institution uh, with this project. That is, we say we actually uh, are part of the board, uh, the, the board of its directors of the project, but also our scientists are involved in the, the data science part of the project, the galaxies, uh, education programs, and hopefully we'll see more involvement here over the years. So this is an artist's drawing of this thing. Uh, so the primary mirror, which sort of lives back in here, so this reflector is sort of back in here. It's going to be 8.4 meters. Okay, so that's uh, about what, about uh, 360 inches or some number like that. All right, 350 inch. Diameter mirror, which lives back in here. All right, so it's a reflector, and uh, I'll tell you more about that design in just a second. But notice this person here. I figured out what I know about the scale drawing here and about how big that mirror is actually back there. I think this person is probably about 12 feet tall, <laughs> if, if drawn to scale. So this must be saying something about the future of astronomers. But anyway. <laughs> But anyway, this telescope, which has this enormous mirror, very short focal length, which means very wide field of view, right? You know that already, right? So this wide field of view is 10 square degrees. Okay, 10 square degrees is roughly what your fist hold, covers at arm's length, roughly. All right, so that's one image will cover 10 square degrees. You say, okay, no big deal. You probably have a camera that does that. This camera will be three gigapixels. 
Okay, the camera at the back of the, or actually the camera's up here. The camera is three billion pixels. You can't buy this online. You can't buy it at Walmart. Uh, if, if and when this is built, it'll cost you, the American taxpayer, through the Department of Energy, about a quarter of a billion dollars for, that, for the camera. The camera alone is one third of the cost of this project. All right, so that's a, a scale drawing of this thing. The good news is that we're finally in a president's budget, so hopefully if all goes well and Congress can <clears throat> deal with things, we can uh, have uh, start by next summer, start building cutting metal. So here's uh, the scale telling you what some of the numbers are. Okay, so I'll tell you what this telescope does in just a second here, but the, the moral of the story is it's gonna be collecting lots of images of the sky, and that's where that 100 to 200 petabyte collection of images comes from. All right, so these, uh, each of these images, as I said, three billion pixels, and there's gonna be lots of them. From those images, we extract sources. Okay, we measure things, stars, galaxies, asteroids, comets, whatever. We measure all kinds of properties, you know, two to 300 different properties, shape and position and color and size and orientation and all kinds of stuff. All right, <clears throat> so we extract all those source information into a catalog or a database. And that database alone, so, this is, so if you're familiar with relational databases, this is a little bigger than most relational databases you'll run into. <laughs> it's 20 to 40 petabyte database. Now the way this is designed, actually it turns out, is a long story, but the short, short version of it is, is that the database is actually distributed across 30,000 different servers. And so when you submit an SQL query, which you can do just like any other SQL query, it looks to you as if it's all coming from one single server. But all the smarts is hidden from you that it's actually distributing the query to all the places where the data are being stored. So it's a pretty fantastic system. So just to mention another uh, financial number, the, uh, so one third of the cost of the, of the construction of this thing is the, is the camera. Another one third is the actual telescope. Oh, I'm missing something. The other one third is the data management system. So the rule of thumb when I, when I worked at NASA was that the, the typical NASA mission, the data management costs were about two to three percent of the budget. <laughs> and so that was the thing that always got cut when they overran. Okay. Can't do that with this project because the whole point of this project is to generate e mass, massive, enormous, or ginormous sums of data. Uh, and to manage all that and to build this 30,000 server relational database, et cetera, uh, requires a data management system that's fully one third of the cost of the whole thing. So this is just an arch architect's drawing of how this thing will look on the mountaintop. Just a few more drawings, so, so none of this exists yet. Oh, I forgot to mention one other thing. A little thing at the top corner here, see this? Mirror funded by private donors. So it's a $20 million mirror. It's already being polished. I'll show you a picture of that in a second. It's already underway. And that's because it's what we, we could start that early because that's the longest uh, item in the schedule. Okay, that's the critical path item. And you have to start many years early polishing a mirror of this size. And, <clears throat> and to get that going, we couldn't depend upon the federal budget cycle like none of us can for anything. And uh, <laughs> so private donors came through uh, and so with completely private money, we could just do anything we would like with the mirrors. And so they're well underway to being polished and uh, prepared. Now, the, the, the person who gave the second most amount of money towards that mirror is a guy by the name of Bill Gates. Probably heard of him before, our Microsoft friend. And the guy who gave the most amount of money from his foundation uh, is a guy who actually wrote software for Bill Gates. He wrote, I think it was Excel and I think Microsoft Word. His name is Charles Simone. He's the tourist astronaut who flew up on the Russian Soyuz a couple times, paid his $20 million to the Russians to fly in space. <laughs> so we have a, so, uh, so Charles Simone uh, made his billions writing software for Microsoft, and if you go to his website, et cetera, his occupation is labeled as tourist. <laughs> so this tourist will, I'm betting, I was a betting person, which I'm not, uh, he would have, he's probably gonna be the person whose name will ultimately appear on this telescope someday in the future, because he made substantial contributions. Mm -hmm. All right, so, architect's drawings, a few more of those. This is real, okay, so a couple years ago, uh, since we had private money, we could do other things besides mirrors, we could actually start leveling the mountaintop, and so they started blowing up the top of the mountain and leveling it, leveling it getting it ready. Where's that? I'll show you in a minute, but it's in South America and Chile, in Cerro Pachon. I'll show you a map in a second. So more drawings. So 
A lot of money was paid for these drawings, so I'm showing you these drawings. <laughs> All right, so, so here's yet another drawing showing uh, sort of the optical uh, elements of the telescope suspended in space, because we can do that because it's a drawing. <laughs> okay, so the primary mirror down here, like as you know, comes down and bounces off the secondary up there and then bounces off the tertiary, third mirror right here, and then up through the optical elements where the camera will live up there. Okay, so we removed the whole structure to show you the light path here. Well, what about this thing down here? What about this? Let's see. Well, once upon a time, I saw this picture on the internet. Okay, so this is a, a telescope mirror about, about the size of the LSST, about eight meters in diameter. It's be, it was being polished, I think, for the large binocular telescope in Arizona. And it's built in the, in the University of Arizona Mirror Lab, whose home is underneath the football stadium at the University of Arizona, because that's the greatest single, single concentration of electrical power in Tucson. As you, as you can imagine. Okay, so they don't do much polishing when there's football games going on. <laughs> but, uh, but the rest of the time they have a lot of power to do so. Okay, so it's pretty big. So I saw this picture and I said, that is so cool. If they ever have such a picture taken with the LSST, I want to be there. And there's the picture. And there's a guy with a yellow LSU t-shirt on. <laughs> I, I was there. Now, turns out this guy, Roger Angel, he's the director of the Mirror Lab. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences for the work he's done in polishing large mirrors, not just those that point up, but a lot of those that point down. <coughs> he wasn't there that day. He was photoshopped into this picture. Okay. But I was there. I swear to God, I was there. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so this is the drawing. And the really amazing thing is, I talked about this tertiary. You already saw it. It's right there. One piece of glass. The outer portion figured to one shape. That's the primary. The inner portion figured to a completely different shape. That's the tertiary. One solid piece of glass, both the tertiary and the primary. Fantastic work going on there. All right, so a little drawing of light paths and things. Kind of cool. Is there a name for this telescope type? Uh, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just out of curiosity, who, made, uh, who actually did the fabrication of the glass? Um, well, the chunks of glass, I don't know. I mean, it was melted there at the mirror lab. Okay. I mean, so it takes many years to do this process. And the first several months is just melting chunks of glass about this size in a huge rotating uh, drum. Okay, And the rotation and not only it allows the glass to transport it around smoothly, but it also puts the first shape in, right? Because as you're spinning it, it, get, it takes sort of a catenary shape. So you get the sort of the first shape of the mirror just by cooling it while it's rotating. It, it, it's a honeycomb uh, yeah, design. Yes, absolutely honeycomb for, light, for, for lightweight. You can see the honeycomb in there, yeah. So they had the styrofoam basically in there, which didn't melt at super thousand degree temperature. Yeah, and then, then they ripped that stuff out, so it's a... Lightweight mirror that one. All right, so there you go. Uh, so let me tell you about it quickly now, then we'll move to the big data story. And that, so LSST takes this 10 square degree image of the sky, and it does two of them back to back. 15 seconds, five second readout, 15 seconds, five second readout. So in every 40 seconds, it gets a pair of images. And the reason we do pairs of images is because you want to get rid, rid of cosmic rays and other artif image artifacts, right? So you always take double images, two in a row. And it'll do that 40 seconds on each part, of the, each part of the sky, and then just do that repeatedly. Tile the sky, as we call it. So it'll take three days to cover the entire visible sky. And then it does it again and again and again over 10 years. So once every three days, 10 years, that means we cover each spot of the sky roughly 1,000 times. That 1,000 times yields, at the end of 10 years, cosmic cinematography a movie of the sky in which we have every single patch of the sky visible from South America, observed roughly a thousand times each. And so what this buys you is two things. One is it buys enormous depth. All right, so this thing can reach down to like 27th magnitude with very high photometric precision. Okay, if you want to get to sort of in the noise, you can get down to 28th or 29th magnitude in every image. <coughs> 
But not only that, because you have this time sequence, you can look for everything that has changed from one night to the next. Every asteroid, every comet, every supernova, every microlensing event, every anything that has ever changed in the universe. And we anticipate, oh, about 10 million of those per night. Okay, so the big data challenge in astronomy, I think, is not so much that 100 or 200 petabytes, and it's not so much that 20 to 40 petabyte database, which are big numbers, it's this number. Every single night, we're gonna get 10, 10 million email messages or text messages every night. Sign up for it now, please. <laughs> we need to enlist every astronomer, every amateur astronomer, every professional astronomer, every human being on Earth who has any interest in astronomy to help us to figure out what these are. And oh, by the way, if you don't get through the first night, there's 10 million more waiting for you tomorrow night and the next night and the next night and the next night. So there's not enough of, so, we, you know, uh, so uh, Dr. Anthony Holinchek standing back there, one of our recent graduates uh, in our program. Uh, he's no longer a graduate student here, he's graduated. But I can say that we don't have enough graduate students in the world <laughs> to analyze this number of events per night. What if you throw in the postdocs? <laughs> we don't have enough anybody's in the world to do this, okay. No, yeah. Postdocs cost more than grad students. No, so it's a, so, so we're going to create this time series map of the universe. And we're going to, and so there's four major science themes. One is solar system inventory. As you can imagine, finding every moving object, every killer asteroid, every near Earth object, anything, everything moving in the solar system. Complete census and tracking. We, this telescope will be the one that satisfies the congressional mandate to find all near Earth asteroids down to the 100 meter or 130 meter, whatever the congressional limit is. So this will, all right, uh, we'll study the nature of dark energy. How do we do that? Well, in order to understand how the universe is accelerating in its expansion, we need to see the most distant things out there that are possible and not, not only see them, but be able to determine how far away they are so we can do the cosmic cosmic cosmography, the mapping. And the way you do that is you find standard candles like supernovae. Okay, so by having repeat observations of the sky, you can find all the supernovae. All kinds of stuff there. <coughs> Optical transients of all kinds, like I said, anything and everything that has changed in brightness or position, we'll find it. So all kinds of new variable stars are waiting to be discovered. So all these things will be seen and detected from its perch down in Chile. So here's a little map here, sort of out, a little outside La Serena on Chera Pachon, okay? So all the images and all the data primarily from the southern sky. So if you want to participate in the follow-up, I suggest you change your latitude. Not your attitude, your latitude. All right, and the last one that's just also really cool is the digital Milky Way. So, it, so I, I, for years I've been throwing these numbers around, and it actually really hit me hard the, not the other day. The, this telescope will have data in that catalog I talked about, the database where we extract all the parameters and store the parameters of all the objects. 50 billion objects, about half of which will be galaxies, about half of which will be stars. That's about 25 billion stars. That's roughly 10% of our entire Milky Way galaxy. That is an amazing number. Roughly 10% of every single star in our galaxy, we will not only have positions and brightnesses and colors and all that good stuff, we will have prop promotions because we have 10 year baseline. And we'll have parallax, so we'll know how far away they are. We will be able to do an entire map, dynamic map, dynamic model of our Milky Way, the, the nearby Milky Way, of course. So this is pretty impressive. So we can look for star streams, we can look for evidence of dark matter, and all kinds of cool stuff. Anyway, so this is just amazing. Uh, if you're wondering about timelines, again, if we get the, if we get the new construction start in next year's budget, uh, operations can start around 2021. So here's a little gar cartoons here. This is a, yeah, that's a real person. Uh, this is not the real focal array. This is just a cardboard cutout, but this is sort of what it looks like. Okay, so there's about 200 CCDs in there, each, which, each of which is 4,000 by 4,000 pixels. That's where we get the six, uh, the three gigapixels and two bytes each, uh, one six gigabyte image every 20 seconds. All right, so that's roughly 30 terabytes every single night for 10 years, and the, all these numbers that I've been talking about. All right. So what's interesting about this 10 square degrees, uh, three gigapixels, is if you look at the Hubble Space Telescope and the data we've collected from Hubble over the last 23 years, okay, launched in started operations in 1990, so 23 years. 
If you sum up all of the sky area that has been covered by Hubble images, so just look at all the different images and sum up the areas of all the images that Hubble has seen in 23 years, in pretty phenomenal productive science machine, I think you would have to admit. That area of sky from the sum of all those images is equal to the sum of the area that this telescope will cover in its first 30 minutes of its 10-year operation. <laughs> You're familiar with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, right? Most productive scientific data archive in the world, probably 20,000 published peer-reviewed scientific articles from that Sloan Sky Survey. I'm sure many of you know about it, have seen it, know about it. Yes? Okay, so it's been the workhorse for astronomical discovery the last decade. LSST will produce the equivalent of one Sloan Sky Survey every single night. So we're talking about something serious going on here. Yeah, so serious. <laughs> so we got a huge amount of these events. We have to try to classify what are these things that are changing. Are they the killer asteroid? What are they? And images, objects, data all over the place. All right. So as I've been alluding to, the big problem is the big data, the big data volumes. It's a really huge, big chap. So that's me getting overrun by my data right up there. OK. Big data is a big problem. So there's several approaches to this. One is uh, computational, okay, so people throw big hardware at it. Another approach is in software that is machine learning algorithms, data mining algorithms, statistics. We uh, call that data science usually. Okay, so throwing algorithms, uh, smart algorithms to learn from data. We'll say more about that as we go along tonight. Another approach is crowdsourcing. So, we weren't kidding about the amateur astronomers and all the rest of the general public who has any remote interest in astronomy. We're already doing this, right? So if you're probably familiar with Galaxy Zoo, mm -hmm. Galaxy Zoo has over 700,000, I don't know what the number is, seven or 800,000 volunteers classifying galaxies for us. They're not, they're not really classifying because that's the science's job. They're characterizing. They're describing what they see, putting a label on it. Is it a spiral? Is it elliptical? Is it a merger? Is it something odd? Is it an artifact? Is it a star? Okay, so just describing what they see. This is, humans are really good at characterizing what they see, describing what they see, pattern detection, pattern discovery, and anomaly detection, finding the thing that's different. Okay, so you can learn more about Galaxy Zoo and several other things at zooniverse.org, which has many different uh, tasks that you can perform, and not just astronomy. So classifying whale sounds and classifying ancient papyrus, Greek text, and all kinds of cool things. Uh, there's a project on there called Galaxy Merger Zoo, the creator of that, say hi to Anthony back there <laughs> for his dissertation. He did an entire dissertation. How many, 500, 600 pages? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, an, an excellent dissertation which he defended just a few weeks ago on Galaxy Merger Zoo, which you can participate if you go here. Anyway, so uh, like I said, one good thing humans are good at is detecting patterns and anomalies, things that are different. So Hanny, Hanny Van Arkel, a Dutch school teacher, teaches third grade, not a trained scientist, not an astronomer, she teaches third grade. She's an she was trained in elementary education. But she loved doing this. She loved galaxies. Like I said, seven or 800,000 people worldwide contribute because they just enjoy doing it, whether or not they know anything about astronomy or not. They just love classifying. And so they might look at that and say, oh, that's a spiral galaxy or whatever. But Hanny looked at this one morning, and she, her, her habit was she did a few of these galaxies before she went to school every morning. And she got, she got to this image, and she saw something in this image, and she posted a comment in the Galaxy Zoo forum. Now, just, if you're interested in, anyone here interested in text mining or text analytics? You do that, anyone like mining social media, Twitter feeds? Well, the Galaxy Zoo forum has roughly 30 million posts. So I think it was a rich source for galaxies, uh, for text mining, if you want to do that. So the Galaxy Zoo Forum allows people to just discuss things they find and just, you know, just have, it's a social network, so to speak, for Galaxy Zoo participants. And so Hanny saw an odd thing in this image, and so she posted a one-word post, one word with a question mark, before she went to school that morning about this object. And the, and the, and the one word was, anyone? <laughs> Can anyone tell me what this is? All right, so, we got, so I'll, I'll tell you in a minute what it is. But uh, it was such a discovery that it, it has a special name. 
Can anyone pronounce that? I heard it. Thank you. Yeah, Furwetter. It's a Dutch word. It's a very complicated scientific term, which means thing or, ob <laughs> or object. So Hanny's thing, Hanny's object. OK, so Furwetter. Of course, most astronomers just call it the Vorwerp. Okay, that's, that's fine. Hanny doesn't mind. All right, so what did she do? What was her discovery? Well, here's a true color picture of that same object. And what she saw was this green blob down here, which actually looked blue in the Sloan images because of the, the color contrast, but that's another story. OK, so she, she was tasked with classifying this galaxy. And I'm sure hundreds of other people classified that as a spiral. And I'm sure the software and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey classified that as a spiral galaxy and all kinds of stuff. So everybody looked at that galaxy, said a spiral galaxy, and went on to the next one. Next one, next one, next one. But Hanny said, no, wait a minute. What's that? Anyone? So this is a true color picture of Hanny's Warwarp. And it turns out, because it's green, it was a very significant clue to astronomers. It turns out it's ionized oxygen gas. So what this thing is actually the light echo of a dead quasar. So this galaxy collided with that galaxy several hundred thousand years ago, presumably. Uh, it induced uh, a, a quasar event in the middle of that galaxy. That is, the interaction of the two galaxies caused some gas to lose angular momentum, fall to the middle, and light up that galaxy as a quasar. So if you were around on Earth 100,000 years ago, you would have seen a quasar here. All right, and then it had a short burst of energy, because it gobbled up some gas, it burped, and then it went, it went out again, waiting for the next meal. <laughs> but you know, the light goes off in all directions, not just beamed at Earth. All right, you know, you know better than that. Uh, it goes off in all directions, and it went off in this direction and encountered some gas, which turned out to be gas that was ripped out of this galaxy because of its collision with that one. And when it hit that gas, it took about 100,000 years for the light to reach out there. Big distance, 100,000 light years. And then that glass gas started to glow. And it glowed in the oxygen emission lines because that's the, the ionized oxygen that was irradiated and ionized by that burst of the quasar. And then after that ionized gas started glowing, it took X amount of time to reach Earth. Okay, so X uh, million years ago, we could have, that quasar happened, and X plus 100,000 years later, this thing began to glow because of that light travel time. And so what we're seeing is the echo of the dead quasar. And it's the first one ever seen before, and now we've discovered a few more now that we know to look for them. And Hanny was a discoverer of a totally new class of astronomical object, third grade school teacher. So that's a true color picture of Hanny's Warwarp. This is a true color picture of Hanny and me. <laughs> it's a kind of dark slides tonight. I'm not normally that dark, <laughs> though I am from Louisiana. That's different. That's not. Anyway, so, so Hanny's story is a really common one, maybe a special one, but still kind of common in, in, the, in the Galaxy Zoo Citizen Science Universe, and that is she was so attracted to this problem of, of understanding astronomy through uh, analysis of data and looking at big data, large quantities of data. I mean, this is why we put Galaxy Zoo up, because we have these millions of galaxies and not enough grad students. Uh, <laughs> that she's now studying astronomy. Right? A lot of people have now gone into science, both either as in, in an education way, that is, they've gone back to school, or they're learning more, they're becoming science advocates. Okay? They're now lobbying their respective uh, governments for more science programs, et cetera. These people are becoming our best friends who participate in these projects. And they're helping us deal with the big data flood, because there are not enough students and scientists and et cetera in the world to look at all these data so if we make a fun game out of it, it's not just a game. We're actually producing real scientific results. But if you make, make it fun, you can enlist volunteers who do it just out of the goodness of their heart. So, so I talked about the three solutions, our types of solutions to big data, one being the computational hardware type of problem, throwing big, big iron at it. Uh, there's software approaches, which we call data science. And there's this crowdsourcing thing where we actually enable, allow other people to help us and look for the patterns and the anomalies in our data. All right. So, if you want to play more with this, uh, go to zooniverse.org. This is a slightly old slide, but there's at least a dozen different tasks you can play with. So check that out. All right, so let's move on to the main topic of tonight before it gets too late here. <laughs> okay. Uh, so big data, small world. What is this? Okay, so I've, I've been sort of telling you big data in the context of astronomy, so I think you got that message. What about small world? 
Well, you've probably heard of this before, the small world phenomenon, right? You've heard of this, uh, maybe you didn't call it that, but for example, when you meet someone for the first time and you discover that you actually know that person or you know someone who knows that person or they're from your hometown or something and you're really surprised, like what a coincidence, right? So you've probably had this happen to you, right? We've all had these small world phenomena, really surprised, meet someone <coughs> that you wouldn't have known. And so I had an experience like this when I was younger. My father was in the Air Force. I was, I'm from Louisiana, so I tell people, even though my name is Captain Kirk, I only work in outer space, I'm actually from Louisiana. Uh, so, um, but, but I never actually lived very much time in Louisiana because my father was Air Force. Some of you are smiling, that was a Star Trek joke, by the way. Uh, <laughs> the, um, so I didn't spend a lot of time in Louisiana because of the Air Force moving us around. And at one point in our lives, we were living in Nebraska, uh, outside Omaha, at the SAC headquarters there, and about 1,000 miles from my hometown, Baton Rouge. And uh, my uh, older brother and I were home one afternoon up there in Nebraska, and a knock at, comes at the door. And it's a young man selling books. Turns out he's selling books to earn money to go to college. All right, so it's, it's during the summer. And it's his, his summer job to make some money. Turns out this guy, this student, uh, who came to our door is from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He's actually going to LSU. And my brother was just about to start going to LSU. My brother had just graduated from high school. So we invited the young guy in. And we started talking to him about the school and all this kind of stuff. Sort of forget, you know, forget about the books that he was selling. We, we were talking about campus life, football, all kinds of stuff. So that was kind of interesting. Well, in the middle of this conversation, my parents come home. All right, so they wonder who this guy is. So we introduce him, tell him the story. Next thing you know, my mom is querying him. And it turns out they're second cousins. So my mom and this guy, who just appeared out of nowhere at our front door, a thousand miles from Louisiana, is her second cousin. When, and you can imagine the whole conversation changed again to what's going on with various members of the family. So that's an example of a small world phenomenon. I mean, it's just like, what? I had another case of a small world phenomenon in my life, which I, I found absolutely amazing. So as I mentioned, I moved around a lot with the Air Force. In a couple of those years of my life, I was in England. I was in this teeny little town town's the wrong word, village, in the northeast corner of England, in East Yorkshire County. So anyone ever heard of Robin Hood? So Sherwood Forest, Robin Hood's Bay, all that stuff is right in that area where I lived, a little town called Driffield. Driffield, Driffield was not all that famous, you probably never heard of it, uh, but it was pretty famous in the early 1960s, which is when I was there as a young child. Uh, my father uh, was assigned there because of a certain thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the Royal Air Force had a missile base right outside Driffield. And now these were not long range intercontinental missiles, but they were tactical range missiles who sat on launchers, mobile launchers. And whenever we drove past that, I still remember, even though I was a small child at the time, I can still remember this day as we drove past on the highway, seeing these hundreds of missiles all pointed east towards a certain country in Eastern Europe. <laughs> Anyway, so I spent a few, couple of years of my life there. We lived on a, a dead-end street, maybe four houses on that street, five houses on that street, played with the kids on that block, and I had a lot of fond memories of that place. So fast forward about 15 years later. 15 years later, I'm in graduate school at Caltech, Pasadena, California, almost the opposite side of the world from England. <laughs> and uh, I was a third-year grad student. And it's the beginning of the semester, beginning of the fall semester, and the new, the new grad students are coming in. So, you know, I decided to introduce myself, to get to know the new grad students. Uh, some guy comes in, he's from England. So we're talking, and, uh, you know, I say, so, so where are you from and all this stuff? And he said, oh, just some little place. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, well, where? You know, just some place you've probably never heard of. And I said, well, is it in East Yorkshire County? And he says, yeah. I said, how did you know that? And I said, well, I used to live in East Yorkshire County. Really? He said, yeah, I, used to, I tell him I used to live in this little town called Driffield, which has a population of like 10 or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, OK, maybe 1,000. I don't know. Guess where he's from? Driffield. So I tell him I used to live on this little teeny street with about four houses called Greenways. And he said, wait a minute, my uncle lived on Greenways. 
I always played with my cousins on greenways, and I remember playing with some American kids when I was about four years old. Uh, <laughs> yeah, small world phenomenon. Okay, so that guy, uh, one of my best friends in astronomy after all these many years, and we always joke when we go to conferences that we played with each other as children. Okay. So big data, small world. So this, so this is the idea of small world. So what big data is doing is it's shrinking our world. It's causing those connections to become tighter and tighter, fewer and fewer steps between you and the next person. So we're going to talk about that using a little simple math here. So it's not too late. You can still do some math, right? All right, so I'm going to use this very simple equation, which is a true statement, as you can see, 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus equals 6 plus 4. And so the, oops, so the context is I'm going to tell you the one big thing about big data. Then I'm going to tell you sort of three characteristics of big data, three things, three ways that the media talk about big data, and three examples of these data science algorithms that we're using to study big data with some extra focus on one of those three. And that the one of those three will, will take us into that conversation of the small world phenomenon, which is often called the six degrees of separation. People ever heard of this? So the six degrees of separation is this concept, true or not, but more, more or less true, that each person on the earth is separated by no more than six steps to any other person in the world. So for example, this guy from England, we are one step away from each other, right? Because I knew him and he knew me. But, uh, but uh, the guy who came to the door at my house in Nebraska, two steps away, right? Because he's the second cousin of my mother, okay? So I never met my second cousins, but I met my first cousins. So there's two degrees of separation. Okay, so every person in the world is separated from everybody else by an average six degrees of separation. So I'm going to talk about, she's the wrong button. I'm going to talk about that in the concept of the big data small world phenomenon. That is, big data is now shrinking our world and making those degrees of separation smaller. And I'm going to give you four examples of how that's happening. All right, so none of this necessarily is, is astronomical, which is why I gave you the astronomy part at the beginning. So this is talking about how this is generally changing our whole world. So, so try to remember this little equation as I go along when I talk about these different steps in the process. Okay, so backing up a little bit, we already talked about astronomy, but think about the early days. Okay, astronomy came into being because people were curious about the universe around them and the world about them. So ever since we began to explore our world, we had questions. And as we ask questions, we got, collect evidence in order to answer those questions. And of course, we, as we get more evidence, which we call data, it leads to more questions. And more questions lead to more questions. More questions lead to more data, and more data leads to more questions. I mean, so you can see this vicious cycle of question, experiment, data, more questions, experiment, data, more questions, and so on. Okay, so that cycle has reached a proportion now where we're reaching exponential growth in our data around the world. So we've collected data to the point where it's become phenomenally huge worldwide in all fields, not just science. So there's me at the telescope. So not just in science, but everywhere. So that's the one big thing about big data is that everyone is collecting it. So social networks are collecting huge quantities of data. So I don't know if you're tweeting right now, but I hope you are <laughs> about this talk. <laughs> so Twitter claims they get like 600 million tweets per day. And that's just me. Uh, no, so social media are generating huge quantities of data. Science, I already mentioned. Businesses are collecting enormous amounts of data. So anytime you do anything on the internet, they're tracking you. There's, NSA is also tracking you, but, but so whenever you buy something, they know what you've bought, okay, and they can make recommendations to you, and we'll talk about that in a few seconds. All right, so businesses are collecting data, governments are collecting data, social networks are collecting data, scientists are collecting data. It's now the main driver of business decisions, of science decisions, of personal decisions even. <laughs> so it's the number one priority in corporate bo uh, boardrooms. It's the number one topic of conversation in those places in number one topic of conversation in federal agencies now. It is. So in 2012, the Obama administration announced the National Big Data Initiative to address this. All right, so it's one of the national priorities right now, the number one co topic of conversation. Okay, so, what, so this is the one. So what, let's talk about some threes. Three characteristics of big data. So as its name implies, big means big volume. Yes, of course. I'll say right up front that big data in itself is a concept that refers to all of the problems related to data, not just volume, but I'm going to talk about volume in this light. Okay, so what do we mean by big? Okay, so I gave you the example of this, how this went from what I could do with my student yesteryear to now a football stadium filled with these, Ch completely changes the ability of the student to, to do a, a project. 
So someone asked this question, how much data are there in the world? So scientists at the University of California, Berkeley in 2003 examined this question, looking at online databases and the, the World Wide Web and whatever you know, different kind of source information they had, and they came up with an estimate that from the beginning of human time, from the beginning of human time until the year 2003, humans created five exabytes of data. That's five billion gigabytes. So that's about 10 billion of these. Uh, if you count all the information and all the libraries in the world, all the websites in the world, all the databases and science centers and government agencies, and businesses, Walmart, Google, everybody. Five exabytes of data. That was the estimate. All right. It's growing. In 2011, that same amount of data was created every two days. And the estimate now is, in this year, that same amount of data is created every 10 minutes. So since I started talking about 40 minutes ago, we've created, in those 40 minutes, four times already the total amount of data that was created by humanity from the beginning of time through the year 2002. And before I'm done, it's going to be generated again. And if I keep on talking tonight, you <laughs> The scary thing about this is not just its big numbers, but even the rate. That's the funny thing about an exponential, right? The, even the rate of growth is exponential. Not only is the growth exponential, but the rate at which it's growing is exponential. Right? So we created this, all of this data in thousands of years of human history. We created the same amount every two days. We created the same amount every 10 minutes. By two years from now, we'll be creating that same amount of data every few seconds. So the amount of time it takes me to give you this sentence, we create the same amount of data as all humanity from beginning of time through the year 2002. It's just ridiculous. So that's one major characteristic, obviously, of big data. Second major characteristic is that it's generated everywhere. It's not just a science thing. If you can't read the bottom there, it says, does this count as big data? <laughs> So it's everywhere. So as I mentioned, social networks, science, transportation, business, healthcare, big issue in healthcare. Government, national security, mm-hmm. You've heard of PRISM and NSA, maybe. Uh, it's everywhere. It's a, actually a very major force in education right now. And what do I mean by that? We, can, we collect data about student performance, student habits, student grades, student finances, student everything. Education institutions are mining that data to predict you know, who's going to default on their student loan, who's likely to fail, who's likely to drop out, who's suicidal. Yes, indeed. One of the big uses of big data nowadays is predicting, it's actually in the news a lot this past week, the Veteran Administration using visual cues data, social data, uh, to look for uh, biomarkers of suicidal veterans after they return from the war. By the way they look at you, their, their eye, eye contact or lack thereof, uh, any, all kinds of signals that can be used. So healthcare collecting huge amounts of data leading to uh, good uh, models, hopefully, of prediction. Yes, I have a question. Sure. How many minutes ago did my personal privacy just dissolve? Uh, <laughs> I think that was 2001, actually. <laughs> <coughs> so you're, yeah, that, that train left the station a while ago. <laughs> so that's number two characteristic. It's everywhere. It's not just the astronomy example I gave you. It's everywhere. Yeah, and privacy is a pretty major issue. If I, if I had another half hour to talk tonight, I could talk at length about the privacy thing. That's pretty... Yeah, the other question is, what's the signal-to-noise ratio on all this data? Well, hopefully, we're, we're trying to make it good. Right? I mean, LSST is going to be really good. I mean, and, but, but if you talk about, like, analyzing Twitter, yeah, there's a lot of noise there. But when you have a million people saying the same thing, for example, hey, there's a riot in the streets in downtown Damascus or something like that, then you can probably believe it. Okay, so, 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 there, so there's a lot of signal to beat down the noise, but there's still a noise problem. That's absolutely true. So third characteristic, which is from the educational institution where you're seated, perspective, is that the job opportunities for those who enter this field are skyrocketing. So back in the day when I came out of school, uh, back in the dark ages, um, the typical rule of thumb most of us astronomy grad students uh, lived by was that there were about 100 applicants for every job we applied for. So a lot of competition. Nowadays, that's flipped. In the field of data science and big data, there's about 100 jobs available per applicant. 
So one of the topics of conversation about big data in the, in, in the White House, in government, in business, is the talent shortage. There's an estimate that was made by the McKinsey Group, a think tank that analyzed this, there'll be a one and a half million person job shortage in the next two years in this field. Not a million and a half jobs, a million and a half person shortage to fill the, to fill the available job. So you take all the people who they anticipate coming out of schools and being trained in training programs, they'll fill X amount of jobs and there's still gonna be a million and a half more jobs left unfilled. So I've heard some really crazy numbers in this area. Really crazy numbers, okay? So uh, a person I heard by second hand, I, don't, I didn't know him personally, but an astronomer who knew another astronomer who did a lot of data science in his postdoc, uh, decided not to do astronomy, decided to go to work for one of these big companies. And uh, Google, I think it was Google, or maybe, no, Yahoo and Microsoft got into a bidding war over him and he settled for one of the two for 400,000 a year. Another job was uh, a person took for 700,000 a year. And the most crazy one I saw was a big data architect the actual job description under salary, it said, anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> now granted, if you're gonna be one of those people, you're gonna have an, an enormous toolkit and skill set. So it's not just the average person who's gonna meet those qualifications, but if you do, ask what you will and they'll give it to you. Okay. So the job opportunities are skyrocketing. I mean, so I tell every student here, whether they major in this or they don't major in that, uh, or if they get a degree in this or they don't get a degree in that, make sure they at least take some courses in this, and if nothing else, okay, because this skill is gonna be what everyone's asking. And it's because we're inundated as a society, as a world, with information, right? The information's coming at us all the time and it's being used for us and against us, but it's being used, and mostly for us, I hope. All right, so those are three characteristics of big data. I talked about that. And the next three things I wanted to mention was how news covers this. One way it covers it is they try to scare us by it. And of course, there's some of these scare tactics are real, especially about the privacy invasion issues. But still, we, we get this sort of fear that there's no way we can handle you know, a stadium full of CDs of data. Okay, so, so big data is really taking us to a tipping point. And by tipping point, I mean we're really changing the way we do business. We're really changing the way we teach. We're changing the way we teach students. We're changing the way government operates. Government is more and more going towards open government, open data, you know, making all that data publicly available. All right, so it's changing a lot of things about society, about government, about business, about our lives. News number two, uh, second way that news covers or characterizes big data is that it leads us to these big insights and new discoveries. And I give three cheers for that point of view. Yes, indeed. Big data allows us to discover things we never thought imaginable. Sort of the same way that Haney discovered that green blob. All right, there's millions of galaxies she just happened to look at that one and, and she was the right person to question what she saw there. A lot of other people looked at that same galaxy and didn't question what they saw there because they just focused on the galaxy and they said, oh, that's a spiral, and moved on to the next one. <coughs> so big insights, new discoveries. <coughs> Third characteristic is that big data are sexy. Don't take my word for it. The prestigious Harvard Business Review says so. All right. So to me, what this means is that it's attracting the best and the brightest. Okay, so when I go to, I go to a lot of big data, data science conferences, and what astounds me is that there's, there's chief technology officers and CEOs of some of these companies, you know, like Bitly and Yelp, and some of these companies maybe some of you have heard of before. And uh, the people, are, those CEOs and CTOs who are standing up there giving talks are younger than my own children. It's scary. Brilliant people. So this is attracting the best and the brightest, which is exactly what we need in order to deal with the avalanche of data bright, young, brilliant young people. And, uh, and so it's, it's that kind of field. It's, it's attracting really great people to it. All right, and then, so we had this one plus three plus three plus three. The last three is the three examples. And I'm gonna focus more on the last one in my last few minutes here. But I wanna mention the sort of these three categories of things we can do with big data. Things you can do, things anyone can do, things that businesses are doing, things that governments are doing. Number one, novelty discovery, finding the rare one in a million, one in a billion, or even one in a trillion. All right, so if you have a lot of data, so for example, we're gonna have 50 billion objects in, this, in the LSST catalog, each of which will be observed 1,000 times. We, that means we will have 50 trillion source measurements. So, we, so if something happens only once in a trillion times, we're bound to find it. If we didn't have that kind of data, we'd just be damn lucky if we ever found it, but good chances we will find it with LSSD. So the bigger your data collection, the better your chances of finding the really rare thing. 
And that's the part of data science that I <clears throat> focus on and that I work with my students on and I think the most exciting is, is this discovery aspect. Okay. So I'm hoping to get the Nobel Prize for something I discover one day, but we haven't got there yet, sorry. <laughs> but anyway, finding the rare thing. So Hany, Hany's object is an example of finding that rare thing. So millions of people, well hundreds of thousands of people looked at millions of galaxies and, and she found that new type of event, that new type of astronomical object no one had ever seen before. Novelty discovery. Then there's class discovery, finding new classes of behavior, new classes of things. So the thing that Hany found is actually a new class of thing. It's, it's a light echo from a dead quasar. Okay, so we're now finding more instances of that class. So classes might also be uh, you know, people who fly in airplanes. There are a certain class of those people who want, who want to fly those airplanes into buildings. We call them 9-11 terrorists. There were 19 of them. How many people fly on airlines every single day in the world? I don't know, 100 million? Billion? I don't know. So in a given year, there's hundreds of millions, excuse me, hundreds of billions of flight hours over 10 years, trillions of flight hours flown by human beings, right? And that particular morning, 19 people for a sum total of I don't know how many minutes <laughs> changed the world. That's a case of a rare, rare one in a billion, one in a trillion type of event. And then, we, and then that day, unfortunately, we discovered a new class of terrorism. You know, on our domestic soil, doing some pretty horrible damage to large numbers of people. All right, so that's an example from Homeland Security. In astronomy, we can find new classes of objects, like I said, Hanny's Vorwerp, or maybe new classes of variable stars, which LSST will do in spades because we're going to have all those time series for 25 billion stars. So class discovery, cool stuff. And finally, association discovery, finding the connections between things which are very unusual and improbable. I mean, what's the likelihood the guy coming to my door in Nebraska is, from my, is my mother's second cousin? What's the likelihood that I meet this guy in grad school I played with when I was seven years old? I mean, come on. <laughs> That's an unusual, improbable association. Okay, so the, the, what the shrinking of the world in my talk, talk, talk title referring to, big data, small world, is those associations, those connections between us which are made through our uses of social media or whatever is causing those number of steps to shrink from six degrees of separation to smaller and smaller steps. So finding unusual and probable co-organizations is a really important part of the business problem for big data or the business challenge or the business opportunity. That is, if I find that you like X, Y, and Z product and person over here likes X and Y product, then maybe they'll also like Z, so let me recommend that to them. So that kind of thing businesses are looking for. I'll say more about that in a few seconds, and then we've, uh, I'm getting close to the end, believe it or not. So here's an example of novelty discovery. Okay, this is a very simple example, finding the one that's different. Okay, that's a simple little example, but that's sort of the general idea, finding the thing that's different. Now in this case, it's the, it's the color that makes it different. Now imagine if you're like a galaxy person like I am, and you look at the Sloan Sky Survey, the two micron all sky survey, the Galaxy Sky Survey, and soon the LSST survey, we'll have thousands of attributes. Not just color, but lots of other things. So how do we find the unusual thing in that thousand dimensional parameter space? Well, that's the challenge. Anyway, so finding the one that's different. That's what we mean by novelty discovery. This is a simple example of classification. So if you can read this, there's top secret and bottom secret. <coughs> this. Okay, so that was meant to be humorous, I guess so. Okay, so classification. Okay, so we do this all the time in astronomy. We collect uh, you know, time series. Say if you're looking at a variable star, you can say, oh, that's an Aurelari, or that's a Cepheid variable, or that's a, this, or that type of variable star, right? So by the shape of the light curve. Okay, so classification means look at the tr pattern in the data, the trend in the data, and classify it accordingly. So this is where I want to spend most of the energy in the last few minutes of my time here. This is disassociation discovery. Finding the connections between things. Finding the unusual, improbable, co-occurring combinations of things. That is, things you have in your shopping cart when you shop online or wherever, and maybe other people, maybe you have some odd things there, and maybe other people will have odd things in theirs, and then you find this connection between people that way. <clears throat> okay, so finding things that have much fewer than six degrees of separation. So finding these connections. So the world talks about this in the context I've already mentioned before. This six degrees of separation, which I've already described to you, this average of six steps from any one person to any other person. Uh, the estimate is now that's actually shrinking due to social networks. So just an average uh, from uh, the original 
a story that was written about this, I don't know how many years ago, uh, to a couple of years ago, they say it's 4.74. Now, I don't know what 0.74 of a person is, but anyway, that's, that's, okay, so that's an average. Okay, so the world is shrinking because there's more connection that's taking place in social media. But I don't, I'm not talking about, when I talk about this in the next few slides, I'm not gonna be talking about social networks explicitly. I'm talking about the fact that you may like certain kinds of things and there's someone over here who likes certain amount of things. And so when you buy a certain product and if this other person also likes all those things that you like, maybe the, a company could recommend the same product that you just bought to that person and maybe make a sale. So, you know, so businesses are analyzing your likes on Facebook and other and websites you visit, believe it or not. Yes, of course, they're tracking where you go. And watching all that stuff, they can make recommendations. And, and therefore, you now have a connection with someone you didn't realize you had before. So the world is shrinking. So there's another example of six degrees of separation. It's called the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Anyone ever heard of this game? Yeah, so the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon is a game where, uh, it's a parlor game, I guess, where you, where you name any actor or person in Hollywood and you try to find six or less <coughs> steps between that person and Kevin Bacon. Like, you know, person A was in a movie with B, who was in a movie with C, who was in a movie with E, who was in a movie with Kevin Bacon. That kind of thing, right? Well, I discovered recently that I'm two steps away from Kevin Bacon. Because <laughs> he appeared in this play called An Almost Holy Picture which was actually written by Heather McDonald, who's a faculty member here at George Mason, whom I actually know. All right, so two degrees of separation. So my world is shrinking. So, so my Kevin Bacon number is two. Okay, any mathematicians in the room here know what the Erdős number is? Yeah. My Erdős number is four. So my Bacon Erdős number is six, which is one of the lowest in the world, amazingly. I didn't, know, I didn't even know that till recently. So I'm actually only one degree away from Kevin because we have the same initials, see? <laughs> All right, so. so six degrees of separation doesn't work just with people, it works with things, okay, products. Okay, so let me give you those four examples and I'll wrap up. Okay, four examples, diapers, Amazon, Netflix, and Walmart. Okay, so you've probably heard this before, but maybe not. Uh, there's an example in the data mining textbooks that's, that was based upon a retail store that analyzed their transaction logs and found that men who go to the store to buy diapers tend to buy beer at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the classic beer and diapers example. If you look it up on the internet, be prepared. It's actually called the beer and nappies example because it was actually just in Britain that it was written about some beer and nappies. Anyway, so. Uh, so I use this a lot in my uh, data ethics course. We talk about data ethics a lot when, when we talk about big data, the privacy issues and, and all this kind of stuff. Well, one of the questions in statistics that comes up in data ethics is this concept of hidden variables. That is, if there's a correlation between the two things, you, there might be something else causing it. Causation, the correlation doesn't imply causation. No. So buying the beer didn't cause the man to buy the diapers. And buying the diapers didn't necessarily call the man, cause the man to buy the beer. But the hidden variable, which is the crying baby at home, probably caused both. <laughs> That's the hidden variable. That's the invariable problem. Okay, so, uh, so it's not clear whether this is a true story or a legend or what, but it works pretty well in the textbooks. Okay, so it's an example of an association, an unusual association. Who would have thought that, right? Men, well, maybe if you thought about it long enough, maybe it makes sense, but anyway. So, but it was a surprise when discovered that, you know, that this, this co correlation occurred. Example one. Example two is the one you probably do see all the time, not just with Amazon, but with others, but Amazon was one of the first to introduce this concept of recommendations. You know, people who bought this book also bought that one. People who looked at this book also liked that one. You've seen this, right? This happens all the time now. But it was very novel when Amazon introduced it about a dozen years ago, and they're using the data from their entire transaction history of all their customers and all their millions of products. That's big data. They make recommendations to you. So again, the fact that you like certain books and someone else likes those books and they bought this other thing here, Amazon might take a bet that you might also want to buy that other book. So why does that matter? Well, it matters to them because they have a limited amount of space on that page to make a recommendation to you, right? I mean, they, they don't want to list 10 trillion things. They want to put one thing there that that's their one chance to maybe make another sale with you when you're, when you're looking at a book or a product. And they want to put the one there that has the most likelihood of success, click through. And so if they're right, they just made some money off you. But if they're right, you just bought something that you didn't know about before, I think. 
I mean, so if, I think of this as win-win, personally. I get recommendations of things I didn't know existed, and I'm really happy to find out about it. And Amazon's happy because they made a little extra money, but that's fine. I'm, I'm happy because I found something I didn't know about. Same thing happens at Netflix, <coughs> based on movie rentals. All right, so there's a lot of interesting things going on here. One of those is collaborative filtering. That's what I just mentioned. That is, other people like that, and you, and you like that, and those people bought, rented this other movie, maybe you'd like to rent that movie. But they're also using what's called content-based filtering. That is, they look at the attributes. Is it a drama? Is it a comedy? Is it a war movie? You know, did it have Brad Pitt in it? Did it have you know, uh, Angelina Jolie in it or whatever? I mean, based upon the characteristics of the movie, and regardless of who else looked at it, if they see what kind of movies you like, they can make a recommendation of another movie like that one. And it's making it's such big money that Netflix ran a prize competition to improve the recommendation algorithm, and they gave a $1 million prize to the team that helped them improve their algorithm by 10%. So a 10% increase in sales for Netflix is, oh, I don't know, about a billion dollars. Okay, so a million dollar prize was nothing to them, but it, it engaged a lot of data scientists around the world. But the one I want to focus on there, and some of you know the answer to this, and you've promised me you're not going to spill the beans. Okay, so this, this is what I, I predicted when it came out about nine years ago, that this would replace the beer and diapers example in data mining textbooks as the classic example of data mining. <clears throat> and it's taken about nine years, and I'm starting to see this story appear now. So it took a while, and, uh, but it's coming true. So what happened was, in 2004, a series of hurricanes passed across the state of Florida. Okay, I don't know if you remember this, but it was like every two weeks there was a new hurricane. It was like three or four of them. I mean, it was just weird. I mean, like, usually hurricanes, you know, they go south, they go north, they go in the Gulf, they go wherever. Or they pe peter out before they get there. But four in a row, I think it was four, maybe three, came and hit the state of Florida. And not only did it happen, but you could see it coming, right? Because hurricanes you can see from way out in the Atlantic, and so you can predict their path, and you know way in advance. And so after this first hurricane hit, Walmart said, wait a minute, we have you know, millions of customers and millions of products and billions of transactions, or as Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions of transactions in the state of Florida. To find, we can look at those, we can mine those data, and see what people really want before a hurricane hits. And we can sell, we can ship more of those products there because we see more hurricanes coming and give people what they really want. So they did this, and much to their surprise, this is what data mining and this big data discovery and novelty discovery is about. So novel dis discovery through association. They found one product that increased seven times higher than everything else in pre-hurricane versus a normal day sales. So many things increased in sales before the advent of the hurricane, but this one particular product increased a factor of seven. Now make sure, I make myself clear, it's not 7% increase, it's 700% increase above everything else. So a lot of things increased in sales, like what? Batteries. Batteries. Ice. Ice. Water. Water. Beer. Water. Water. Toilet paper. Toilet paper. <laughs> Condoms, a lot of different, a lot of different things increased in sales. But that, but the things you just named were just the baseline. That was just the baseline. Everything you just named. There's one product which stood out a factor of seven above all of those things. Generators. These are all good suggestions, but that's not the answer. <laughs> True story, follow the links, you'll see. Well, in hindsight, one could say, why did this happen? And I have a few suggestions. It's a packaged food, it has a long shelf life, individually wrapped servings, doesn't need refrigeration, kids like it, adults like it, it's a breakfast food, it's a snack food, da 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 All kinds of interesting reasons why you might think this would be it. But, and you don't have to eat it either. Anyway, no, I actually. I actually brought some with me. Uh, oh, never mind. Too, too late now. Okay. So, strawberry pop tarts. So, this was an unusual co occurrence. The arrival of a hurricane or a natural disaster and the dramatic increase in sales of strawberry pop tarts. Okay. So, this type of discovery we call association discovery. Okay. Association 
of one thing with another, which is exceeds above all your expectations. So yes, we expect toilet paper and water and generators and duct tape and plywood and all kinds of things to increase. We expect all that to happen. And Walmart and Lowe's and Home Depot and all those people probably supplied a lot more of that stuff during that hurricane season to Florida. But Walmart figured out what people really wanted <laughs> and they shipped, they shipped enormous pallets of strawberry Pop-Tarts to Florida. Yes, they did, before those next hurricanes and sold them out. So again, it's a win-win, right? But Walmart made money, but hey, they gave them, the people, what they wanted. That's, that's, to me, that's okay. I mean, not people want to criticize, but hey, I want to be told and given choices, especially when I want something like that, okay? Anyway, so, so what's happening then in these situations is they're looking at patterns of purchases. So social media are providing examples of what people like, whether it's websites, whether it's hotels, restaurants, whatever. Whenever you click a like, for example, on Facebook, that information is being tracked. And so if you like a whole bunch of things, and there's other people who like those same things, then the next time you, say, mention that you bought a certain book, they might recommend that book to those people, those other people who like similar things to you like. So I do this as an example in my class. I make it do a very, very simple toy example. And I show the students uh, in my class 20 sample Facebook users. And I list things they like. You know, like movies, picnics, peanut butter, hot dogs, you know, whatever. List a bunch of things, right? And uh, after I show them this data, I say, what's missing here? Of course, they don't know what I'm talking about. What's missing there is I did not identify any single person by name. All that data is anonymized. There's no way I know, of course, I've made up the data, but I mean, in the real world, people say, oh, you know, they're stealing my identity and all that, you know, they're invading my privacy. No, what this, the open graph, as it's called at Facebook, allows companies to mine those likes that network of likes, that association network, the six degrees of separation, which is now growing smaller. They're mining that network without any names on it. So they don't know it's you that likes X, Y, and Z. They just know you like X, Y, and Z, and they like X, Y, and Z. And so the next time they like X, you know, <clears throat> they say they like something else, they can make a recommendation to you. So I use this example in my class. And I, and I fudge the data to make a point with the students. And I fudge the data so when we do the little so association analysis, it's not beer and diapers or hurricanes and Pop-Tarts. What we discover is there's an amazing co-occurring association of people who like picnics and people who like peanut butter. Of course, I made this data up on purpose. Okay, so, we, so, they, so they do this little exercise and they find, wow, all these people like, there's all these likes which are at sort of random in the noise and then there's this high peak signal of people who like picnics who also like peanut butter. So I tell them, don't be surprised the next time you're on Facebook and you say you're going on a picnic, and you update your status and say you're on a picnic, that all of a sudden an ad pops up on your Facebook page selling peanut butter. That's where that came from. They, they mined that co-occurring association through all the enormous social media to find that people who are going on picnics like that, and so they make a recommendation to. So these are examples of how purchases Web search histories, websites visited, product preferences, uh, all kinds of stuff. Even your locations, because your, your smartphone is tracking where you are, even where you are right now. Okay, so what you like and what you do and where you go, what you purchase, et cetera, all that provides linked information uh, to businesses, social media, outlets, uh, retailers, government agencies. They're all using this information, hopefully, Again, I want to stick on the positive side here. Using this information to improve your life, to sell services and products that you actually might like, and consequently, they're shrinking your world. So get used to it. Big data is shrinking your world. The six degrees of separation between you and everyone else is shrinking rapidly. So thank you very much. Uh -oh. Yes, Bill. Bill one. Uh, <laughs> what, what, so what courses would you recommend an up-and-coming college student take in order to enter this? Well, I can give the, a long list, but uh, I, I think a, it's a general course in um, working with data. I mean, I don't know how to, quite how to say that. Okay? So, uh, so I teach a graduate course called Scientific Databases. We cover, we cover databases, modeling, and 
query languages, data mining, semantics, uh, visualization, uh, all kinds of aspects of working with data, learning from data, managing data, doing discovery from data. Okay, so statistics definitely is a big part of it. Uh, so, so I can do that in a graduate course. I can cover 17 topics in 17 weeks and the students just have to like it. I mean, right? <laughs> they don't have, but as an undergraduate, we have courses focused on statistics, data, data mining, visualization, and computing, programming. So modeling and simulation courses like MATLAB. So learning, learning some MATLAB or some Python or some kind of scripting language is good, a good starting point. I mean, yeah. But anyway, so we tell our students, uh, so we have, a, we have a program in computational science and we tell the student, computational science is using computers and data to do the science. It's not about computer science. It's about using those tools to do science. Yeah. Yes? So that program, person of interest, isn't that far fetched? No, person of interest, uh, you've seen the, the, the movie uh, the, uh, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. A lot of these stories are really <coughs> what's happening. Yeah. I mean, sports analytics, is a really big business. So what happened, Moneyball is based on a true story, how the Oakland A's used the data mining to, to pick the best players in the draft and the, and the free agent and actually won the World Series accordingly, right? So, the, so I just saw an ad, so I, I get these ads every day from uh, these talent hunters looking for people doing data science and data mining and big data. And I saw one yesterday for uh, the, uh, the manager for uh, basketball analytics operations for the NBA. So this person reports directly to the executive vice president of the NBA. And I said, oh, that'd be kind of cool. Anyway, so yeah, so big day. I, one of, if I had time to tell you my backstory, one of the first things that appealed to me besides the story I told you at the very beginning about the, the astronomy data that was dwarfing everything else at NASA was another story I heard about how the NBA is using data mining. And this was 15 years ago to analyze all the play-by-play -play histories of, the, of opposing teams in order to know how to coach each and every play in their games. But that's a, it's a big deal. You had your hand up? Yeah. Yes. Uh, in the first part of your presentation, uh, the, the, the scope that you were talking about that uh, mm -hmm. is uh, under construction, the 8.3 meter one, mm -hmm. what was the reason that it was decided to locate it in the southern hemisphere? Well, uh, one reason is the, um, the infrastructure for astronomy is very strong in Chile. I mean, they have telescopes from Europe. Americas, Japan. It's also extremely high altitude, very dry, above most of the water vapor, very clear skies. There's a lot of very strong reasons. Plus, the Andes Mountains are very peaked right up against the coast because of the plate tectonic stuff. And so you get that laminar flow of the air across the ocean, and so you have very steady, low, you know, good seeing conditions. So when you're in, in Hawaii, you get a lot of that, but you also get a lot of sort of turbulent air that were flying around all those different islands. Okay, so Chile has a lot of advantages. It's not the best site in the world, but close to, I guess. Okay. So the processing of this data, you mentioned earlier that the wire speeds aren't exactly scaling in the same way. As no, not at all. Time. So uh, one of the challenges with uh, dealing with, with astronomy data is something's going to have to characterize all of the raw data. Exactly. <laughs> you want to be able to you know, push your, re your request out to these data sets. Right. So, you know, uh, how, how big of a challenge is the proper characterization in, in these data centers where that data is going to be happening? Well, you, well, you hit on several very important points that we're looking at. Uh, one is the phrase, you know, ship the code, not the data. So we've been saying that for years. Sh you know, ship the processing to the data. Don't bring the process data to you because we just can't do that anymore. But, but the characterization step is actually one of the areas that I'm actually working on for the project. That is, if you, if you can characterize the, that massive data set by a few numbers, okay, in the same way, for example, a galaxy, you can specify by its, its shape, its orientation, its color. So there's a few numbers that can specify that galaxy image, which has you know, many millions of pixels. So instead of shipping a million pixel image, if I ship you 10 numbers, you have enough information to decide whether you want to look at the rest of the galaxy. Okay, so that characterization part is the, is the real challenging part that we're looking at. And so trying to make sure we come up with not just general characterizations, like I said, color and position, but a lot more detail. And coming up with wh what those things are as part of a, you know, what we're going to be spending the next eight years doing. So. Question back there. Yeah, you were talking about the sampling on the LSSD telescope, which is broad sampling. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Can you say what that sampling is like? You look at it and then you go back 10 hours later. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, uh, so we do this 40 second pair, as I mentioned, right? So 20, 15 seconds, a readout, and 15. So we get a pair. We come back like an hour later on that same patch. Then we come back later that same night on the same patch. Then we come back three days later on the same patch, and all that repeats over the course of the mission. So you have sampling on seconds time scale, minutes, hours, days, weeks. So, so basically, if we're looking for things that vary on one of those time scales, we'll have sampling on those time scales. So it's not linear sampling. As we don't just, you know, every hour we look at something, because now you've got that alias of one hour built into your data. So we try to avoid the alias. There's a question over here. Yeah. Uh, where is the data going to be? Uh, it's going to be back home. Uh, number of right? Well, the primary data center will be at the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where the, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications is, and because NCSA is the biggest compute facility for private, I mean, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> for public research. I mean, certainly there's behind firewalls at DoD and other places there's big computers, but the one that it, the general scientists can use will be will be at N NCSA. That's what. It, the nation is building the biggest computers there. So the data will be on the same floor in the same building as those data. And so it, so it is shipped from Chile up to the United States. Now a couple of interesting things about that is it's got to go through fiber cable. And so they sort of scope this out of, of what will be the capacity of the fiber optics cables under the Atlantic and its, its backup on the, on the Pacific side because if one gets cut you have the, the backup. And it turns out the, the, the data volume that LSST will generate 10 years from now will correspond to roughly 50% of all the bit traffic between the two continents. If you, and that, that bit traffic includes all businesses, all governments, all social media, all everything between North and South America. LSST will be 50% of that. But that's, that's today. What is it going to be? That's, that, that's the plan. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the projection. That's the projection. And the other interesting thing is, there's, there's fiber cables coming down the mountain to get to La Serena, which is where the first processing is done in the little town of La Serena before it's shipped up to the U.S. And so what if, what if a, a Chilean farmer runs over the cable and <laughs> cuts it? All right, so it might take a few days to repair that fiber cable. So, so the telescope will have built-in uh, thumb drives, <laughs> so to speak. Solid-state storage, <laughs> not, not thumb drives, but solid. Okay, it'll have about 300 terabytes of solid state storage in the camera. So we can, we can basically take images for about four or five days before we have to worry about uh, the cable being cut. So we have, like, we, have, we have capacity for about two or 300 terabytes actually on the camera. I think we've got time for a couple more questions yeah. and then we'll wrap up. All right, and, and, and yes. So thank you for not mentioning the strawberry Pop-Tarts. We had a deal before we started today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Since there was a lot of science before computers, yes. where did we go to learn how data was handled and managed in science before mm -hmm. computers? Where did we go? Who studies that? Well, I guess, uh, I mean, the historians of science look at that, of course. Uh, librarians are a good place to look. So librarians are basically, historically, the information managers of the world, right? And since libraries have sort of like lo lost a lot of uh, favor and attention, so to speak, I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people visit libraries anymore because everything you can find online pretty much. And so libraries, especially universities, are taking over this data management role for scientists at managing their data. So, so if you look back historically, they've actually had that role before where they've actually curated, provided metadata, descriptive, you know, access to data, and uh, it, so, part, I mean, part of the historical problem, though, is that it's not that one. The, other, the real historical problem is that scientists kept the data in their drawers and didn't share it. And so I used to joke with my astronomers, they say, well, what has data mining ever done for astronomy? And I said that astronomers have been doing data mining since the beginning of time. You know, the data are mine and you can't have them. <laughs> 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 yes. The mirror and the mountaintop leveling was paid by private funds. The camera will be paid for by Department of Energy. Why are they interested in this? Uh, okay, and then SF, the rest of it. So, so DOE is the, uh, has not just uh, sort of fusion and fission type of energy, you know, practical energy applications in their, under their umbrella. They also have uh, high energy physics. 
So all, most of the high energy physics, like the Large Hadron Collider and particle physics, as designated by Congress, Department of Energy funds high energy physics research. And part of high energy physics research is extreme scale cosmology. What happens at the extremes of, of the universe, that is the very beginning of the universe when it's super hot, super dense, and the material is in who knows what kinds of states. <clears throat> and something happened in the beginning of the universe that enabled dark matter and dark energy to come into existence, or, or, or something to happen that has the characterizations that we call dark energy. And so dark energy, which is this new discovery in astronomy of the last decade or so, of how the universe is not just accelerate, expanding, but accelerating, that dark energy uh, is a problem that's under the purview of the Department of Energy to investigate. And since that's one of the major science drivers of LSST, dark energy, it's in, in the um, wheelhouse of Department of Energy to uh, fund that particular branch of the science. And the way Department of Energy and NSF decided to split the cost in a very clean way is, you know, DOE will build the camera and the science that goes with dark energy, and NSF will do all the rest, you know, the facilities, the roads and commodes and stuff like that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank, thank you all very much for staying past 9 o'clock. <laughs>